Cork Sir John Sheehan, Lord Mayor of Cork. We're here today in Bellsfield, in the heart of Cork City, to celebrate this year's Cultural Award winner, Conal Creedon. Through his writing, storytelling and filmmaking, he has managed to bring to life so much that is unique to the people and the history of Cork. And it gives me a great pleasure and honour to award him this Cultural Award this year. Congratulations. He encapsulates, I suppose, many, many everyday experiences and brings them to a much wider audience. And his love of Cork and appreciation of Cork comes to the fore in all his work. So it's an honour on behalf of the city that he has gr gratefully accepted this award and the thanks of the people of Cork for all that he has done. Conal, thank you very much. Lord Mayor, thank, thank you very much. And uh, really, this is, um, this is the award. And it means an awful lot to me. Um, I, I suppose I've always wanted to say to an ahasarum, I'm flat as a glacker, so I'm firm, car curky. No, um, but um, it actually means an awful lot to me, obviously. And, um, uh, you know, to be selected by yourself and by the city, it's, it's as good and as important as it gets, really. And um, this will take really pride of place at home. Very much appreciate it. Good morning, Margaret. Today I had the honour of presenting the 2020 Cultural Award to the writer, broadcaster and storyteller Conal Creedon. It was a huge honour for the city and one that we are delighted to make um, given his vast contribution to all things that are Cork and the cultural life of Cork City. This evening I'd like to welcome him, I'd like to welcome Conal and I'd also like to welcome Liam Renane, the city librarian for a discussion on the arts and on your career and your view of the arts in general. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time, coming here this evening and having the discussion. Liam, I might hand over to you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Cornell, um, you know, your, your work is very much grounded in, in this city, uh, whether novels or, or plays or, or the films that you've made. And yet, they clearly have struck a chord uh, all over the world most recently, you've won the Eric Hoffer Award and your plays have been put on in New York City and in Shanghai. And you've done uh, readings in all over the world in Austria, as far back as McCroom even. So, you know, you, you, you push both buttons, the, the local and the universal. What, how do you think um, that has come about? Do you know, to tell you the truth, I think it's only one button really, right, because like, I think everybody understands the sense of, we'll say, a nation, right? And then you take a step back and people understand the sense of, we'll say, a community. And then you go back further and you get a sense of a neighbourhood. And then you come back further, family. And then eventually you come down to one person. And most of my, well, particularly with the novels, right, it's usually one person tortured in his brain, right? And within that brain, he sort of, or she tangles with all those other things, right? And and I think if you can distill it down to one individual, um, it doesn't matter where you set it because people are people, you know. And it's sort of and also I suppose I travel like I do. I I I go to audiences, right? So I, I you know I I do go to the states. I do go to China. I travel around Europe with my stuff, and it's important to let people know that you're doing this as well. And I think. So it's hard to know if it's successful or not, but that's what I do. And I figure it's just about doing what you do and, you know, do what you do, do well, basically. Yeah. Um, this award um, that the Lord Mayor has given you is for your contribution to culture. So it's, it's not only about writing, you know, you're, you're involved in, in the cultural life of the city. And indeed, one of the things that strikes me uh, about you in comparison with, say, some other writers from the south of Ireland, um, I mean the 26 counties, no, not just Munster, is the way you've connected with the culture of the north of Ireland and especially Belfast. Um, that can't have happened just by accident. Did you, did you kind of well, consciously you, do it? You know, truthfully, uh, you know, I, I do think that um, it's a shared culture. I think it's a shared uh, history. I think you look back at 1601 when O'Neill O'Donnell came down here to Kinsale. That was pivotal for, it was the last of the whole, I suppose, the old Celtic Celtic order, really, right? Well, people would argue, but that, that was a big one, Kinsale, right? And they came down to Kinsale for that. And then you look at 1798, which was predominantly, you know, what you consider not to be current 
nationalism, right? But the United Irishmen, and if you go to the um, uh, the, um, uh, the National Monument, which is a 1798 monument, it's funny, if you look at each corner, on the left-hand corner is the 1798 people, right? And all the names are so familiar, and yet it would be considered now a different culture to ours, you know? Um, and as you go around, you're the Fenians, and 1798 and 1916 are the two big ones from the point of view of you know, names that resonate down through the years. And then, of course, our, our own culture, you know, uh, Fimaku, um, Ferdia, um, Ku Cullen, they're very much like part of the Northern Epic, the Town, and that's ours as well as theirs. So there isn't enough in them, it's the one nation. And then coming closer, like 1969, my father brought us up to Belfast, the family, um, to visit my mother's cousin, who was uh, staunch, uh, Protestant, um, Orange Man. We went up for the 12th of July, actually, for the march. Um, so that connection, there was always a connection. And even a few years after that, w when the refugees were coming down, our street being sort of an epicenter, or like, you know, it, it was the last, we say, 19th century Cork. There was still sort of, I wouldn't use the word tenements, but multi families living in one big building with outside toilets. Our street, that was it. And uh, a number of, um, refugees arrived down, families, young families, you're talking about people who were very young with young kids and with nothing but the shirt on their back and uh, I remember there was one guy in particular, he was around 13, same age as me and um, going out to see Cork Hibbs in Derry, he was from Derry and his name was, I can't, it's either O'Reilly or Riley but on our street the nickname we had on him was English even though he was from Derry, right? Because that was the nickname. And, yeah. you know, but like, it'd be very, un it'd be politically incorrect these days to do that, right? But, uh, you know, he was part of us and totally accepted. And that gave me an awareness of, you know, that this is whatever about lines and maps or whatever, but there's a culture and the, the, like on both sides of the so called divide, right? That, that, that needs to be celebrated and engaged with. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your street there, uh, Devonshire Street. Yeah. And you grew up in a, in a fairly large family there. But your father was a, an Inchigila man and your mother from Bantry. Yeah, Barry, yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, so the, like, was there storytelling in the family before you said? Well, you know, not so much storytelling in the family, but like, if you think about it, right, like, I feel like I'm really old, like talking about the last century, but pre-internet, pre-YouTube, pre-all that kind of stuff, there was huge credit given to somebody who could do something, right? Like I remember my mother saying, you know, like it would be considered he's a great dancer or such as can really sing a song or to be able to do something because people had to entertain themselves, you know, or be entertained and uh, to have something. And we had a shop and the shop itself, certainly people, you know, you didn't go into people's houses so people came out to the street and people would gather like the, the whole thing of the corner boys. We had corner boys, but our shop was in the middle of the street. I'd say it's the only place where corner boys congregate in the middle of a street, not a <laughs> corner, right? Because the glow of the shop. But then the shop itself became a forum as well. So people often, no problem to see. When I was a kid now, and I'm talking about later years, but you know, the 70s, early 80s, you, you would have a song in the shop. The show bands would come because there were no late night restaurants. They'd come from the Hilton, right? So whatever band was playing, they would come over for Milk and Chester or whatever, right? And there was, um, and storytelling, obviously. If somebody had a story to tell, people would just get around and listen, and it could mm. be anything. Mm. It could be about a swan that, you know, came into someone's house when the cat was having kittens, or, or you know, about a neighbour up the street who planted the Coventry bomb and how he got back, and, you know, it, like, you just can't tell. But people would gather and be entertained because... You know, television wasn't that big back then. It lasted a few hours a day, and most often the screen just had its done ilding and brush a show. You know, the, 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 the thing was broken down, right? So, like, uh, entertainment was verbal, you know, mm. and I guess that's where it comes from. My father could tell a story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you're um, uh, well known as an early riser. Um, do you have a, 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 a routine in your life that kind of is built around uh, the writing process? Not particularly, i tell you the truth, um, I'm very undisciplined, you know, uh, from the point of view of that whole thing, but I do get up really, I go to bed really early, like I go to bed maybe seven o'clock in the evening, but I get up very early in the morning, and um, so I, I don't really have discipline, I could do nothing for ages, but what I have is I'm sort of highly motivated, which is different, right, because, and I, 
I think that's because, first of all, I love what I'm doing. End of story. Like I, I wake up in the morning, you know, it's not working, right? It's this is just in, it's like being a fisherman and wake up by a river every single morning. It's just brilliant. So I love what I'm doing. And the second thing is that the sense of like well-being that I get from other people, like you know, even coming across you now today, right? You know, a guy would say, you know, keep up calling, you're doing great. I wouldn't know who they are, right? And that in itself. Is motivating because you're slow. You, you don't want to let that down either, right? And um, and then of course something like this, you know, this it sort of it, it sort of lets you know you, that maybe you're doing the right thing, especially mm -hmm. when half your life you think you're doing the wrong thing, you know. <laughs> and that's the truth of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sort of, um, it's endorsement is a huge motivator. This kind of third party endorsement and endorsement from people who interpret your readings, like you know, sort of feel okay, you know, there's a sense of. Uh, you know, I, I, I need to step up to the mark here, right? And um, and then because I love doing it. So that's that's the motivation, but the discipline is gone. Absolutely. Mm. Right. Well, you're one of the two, sir. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, two out of three, isn't it? Because <laughs> I get out of bed early as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I beg your pardon. Two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> um, uh, then may I mention that, you know, you're, you're known as a playwright and a, and a novelist. But a couple of years ago, you devoted a huge amount of time and effort into researching the life of Michael O'Leary, yeah, of course, uh, the, who won the Victoria Cross during the First World War. Um, how did uh, that story resonate with you in the first place? For the same reason as everything else. Everything else I do is basically set on my street. End of story, right? So the documentaries, uh, the burning of Cork. It's because what got me into that first one was that behind our house. There was a trade union hall that was burnt down the week before, and on Hardwick Street there was a dance hall burnt down, which was Irish dancing. McCurtain met his wife on Pine Street, so I was sort of engaged at a dance down there, right? And um, I, I saw it as a local history, actually, right? The father of Flynn's story, similarly, because it had to do with an art man and um, the boys of Hill, it was all about the bowling, the, Har the Harriers, and it's sort of my culture again, right? And, and basically, with Michael O'Leary, our shop was the Inchigila Dairy, and Inchigila is another name for Ivleri, and mm. Ivleri means the land of the O'Learys, and um, he was from Ivleri, or from Inchigila, and on our street we had the Ivleri bar up the street, my father was, was Inchigila, my cousins had um, the Ballingary Dairy over on uh, Anglesey Street, um, or no, Anglesey, um, Adelaide Street, and then you tied Leary, the Cork Arms, and it was like a, a little Ivleri, where we were, because people would come to the house, to the shop, you know, to get messages, send stuff home, who would died, or whatever, because, you know, people didn't have phones or Facebook or whatever, right? And, you know, mothers would send bread up and they'd send down maybe even money, God knows, right? And, and or they'd buy some farm implement and they'd go back down and be left in our shop. And it was that connection of always being aware that if Larry is where we were and where we were from, there'd be always old Larry's, my dad's friends, outside the counter, half them bus drivers, because, he was a bus driver himself. And when I was about 10 years of age, and we no a bit older, maybe 15, I came across a comic, a Victor comic, and there was no Larry in it. And um, I just asked my father, is he one of us? And my father said, absolutely, he's from Colleen. And then from there, I still have the comic, actually, I still have it at home, but it, it, I've been sort of interested ever since. And when you, from the library, offered the opportunity to do something for the World War I, for World War I's uh, commemoration, I had never thought of doing anything on him, really, but I was interested, hugely interested, and I, it was a great opportunity, and I just totally engaged, you know, I mm. was, um, loved it, and, you know, really appreciate the city, that the city brought it out, really, and the library brought it out, because I certainly would never would have, and no publisher would have taken it on, and it's one of the books I'm probably proudest of, actually, you know, because mm. I think it's, it's, there's fiction and history there, it's, there's, it's myth, it's a fairy tale, you know, history tale. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. It's, it's an amazing story. Yeah. But yeah, this your most recent uh, book, Begotten Not Made, is, is a great read as well. Uh, very different to the O'Leary story. But uh, before we get on to um, the, the, the book, it's, or the, the story itself, uh, you published it yourself. Now, that must be um, some challenge, you know, f taking something from inception through various drafts to getting it out there. Plenty headaches as well as rewards, I'd say. Do you know, n not particularly it because, right, like, uh, I suppose I haven't had a job since around 1982. Um, I was in the gas company, and since then I've sort of done my own thing, right? And so I set up, maybe about 15 years ago, Irish Town Publications, Press, and Irish Town Productions. 
and the press was for publishing, so I published a few books there, and the productions was for touring plays and for making documentaries and that kind of thing. And, you know, the whole idea of just writing a book, and even with the Michael O'Leary book, like Stuart Collin, who was the designer for mm. C Library, like, it was just total engagement. Because, I, I, like, in fact, I was drawing the cover before the book was finished. And I remember showing you the cover, and you were saying, Okay, maybe she's just go and write the bloody book. You know, this thing has gone on a long time. But you know, and it's the same with this that there are sort of drawings and that, and I had them drawn before the book was finished because I didn't know where it was going at that point. And uh, if you look at this, the font and that is one hundred percent original. Like you won't get it in another book. It was designed by uh, Sean Harrington, uh, Shandon Design, and uh, that, so I love that kind of engagement. Uh, John Foley from Byte Design did the um, cover and um, and the layout and so he would come to the house and with the other books as well we've done right and there's that real sense of anticipation that I'll show you with the cover or what you think of this and uh, the whole thing of handing over a lot of words and getting back a book just seems cold it's a bit like total football it's yeah. like you engage and it's um, my job even though I love it, it can be very lonely, right? Like when you're sitting in a room, I don't be that lonely, I have a dog, right? <laughs> but you know, you're on your own, right? So I love the engagement thing of this, uh, or with a play, or a documentary, or even, you know, with books that I've done with you. We've done two with the City Library, actually, the Cornerstone as well, the UCC one. And um, once again, just loved the engagement from start to finish, design, looking. Mm. And I'm happy enough not to have an input. But just to be around, it's happy. You know, I don't really yeah. want to control everything. It's happy enough to be allowed to be around the place. Colin, what would you say to any aspiring writer, storyteller, filmmaker out there? Have you given your you know, experience? The mad thing is, right? That's a question you'd often get asked, right? Because I, like, I do. Uh, sometimes I talk to groups, right? Our groups come to the house, like often Americans or Chinese will come to the house. They'd be writers and. That's the kind of question I'd ask. And there's six things, I think, really, right? Um, now, I probably won't remember them, right? But I've worked them out and said, number one, um, don't drink. Number two, don't smoke. Number three, don't do drugs. Number four, be good to your mother. Number five, be good to small furry animals. Mm. And then number six is whatever you want to do. In this case, writing, right? So if you want to be a politician, do all the other five, and that'll be fine, right? If you want to be a writer, do all the other five and write. And I, I think that's the big thing. I mean, I wouldn't be somebody who would say, you know, don't go to university. To, I think absolutely go because, um, you know, it, 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 like these courses are actually really brilliant. I, I would have been cynical enough before I was up there as writing resident. I just saw how brilliant the, the students were. But the big thing is, regardless of all that, is if it's in you to write, just keep writing because... Uh, it's like swimming or running or playing football. You get better at it, you know? And uh, that, that's the only thing. But the other five are really important because even though God knows I've actually broken all... Well, I haven't broken... I've broken five of the six, but I won't tell you which five. <laughs> <laughs> um, but truthfully, uh, you know, those are the things that will hold you back, you know? The, 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 you know, not being good to your parents. They're the things that will mess you up later on in life and... Small furry animals, always. Like, this is a huge honour, right? And in my line of business, if you want to call it a business, it's it's all about, you know, I suppose, that sense of convincing myself that what I'm doing is of merit. Because you, you wake up on a Monday morning and there is no cue outside the house saying, you know, can I have a short story corner, right? Like when I had a laundrette, they used to say, you know. And so sometimes, well, all the time, it's this kind of third party endorsement, you know, fr from Lord Mayor's office and from yourself as well. And the Eric Hoffer Award that you won just in well, the last Well, absolutely, but the, yeah, the, the, there's something about in your own town, in, among your own peers, is very special because, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a milli and you find, God, that's very nice to get that, right? Mm. And also, I remember last year, Carol Sullivan got it, and I really felt very proud for Carol Sullivan. I remember thinking, she's brilliant and deserves it. So I, to be told this year, I really didn't feel I deserved it. You know, I felt, oh, my God, but I'm not a Carol Sullivan, you know, and uh, I felt very special, and I really appreciate it, Lord Mayor, really. Mm. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, yeah. And thank you on behalf of the city. Well, thank you, you very much. Our lives, many. Really.
many, many levels. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.